cool. I'm going to screen share. <clears throat> Okay, so I want to keep uh, pick up where we left off uh, before our most recent field trip, where we were talking about um, approaches to how we might um, uh, conceptualize our restoration and how we might frame our restoration, understand it, what would be reference, can what are the reference conditions, etc. So I'm uh, just going to jam through some of these very quickly that we've already spent time on. Um, but uh, we were talking about, uh, if you recall, we were beginning the conversation about um, uh, what was what is reference, how do we do monitoring, all that kind of good stuff, and um, we we started with this this notion of um, uh, is there a problem in the first place? Then we would want to stop the problem, and then we want to do the restoration. Um, we talked about defining a reference condition that could be a priori. That could be historical, best guesses, or, or using other people's best guesses. Um, we ran through what is natural, we ran through the notion of shifting baselines and all that good stuff. <clears throat> uh, we talked about some examples of, of traditional, uh, uh, traditional impacts in wetlands and traditional uh, human interactions with wetlands in California. And all around, we talked about approaches, historical approaches to what might be a guide for our restoration or a reference condition. Um, and uh, yeah, okay. And we, we went through our, our discussion of how we might establish a, a target or a goal for the restoration using um, um, conditions, either historic conditions or conditions we're measuring right now as the guide. Um, we talked about rapid assessments, et cetera. Wait, did we talk about rapid assessments? I don't remember. You guys yeah. remember? We did, okay, good, okay. So, so we talked about uh, uh, rapid tier two assessments. Um, oh yeah, that's right, yeah, there, then we talked about some of our CRAM results. Okay, so now I wanted to talk specifically a bit more about uh, our local area and the, uh, sorry, any questions about that stuff leading up to this? Or, or questions about stuff from, from our Ash Avenue field trip? Okay, all right, great then, we'll, we'll, we'll keep going. So I uh, wanna uh, not shift the focus, but just remind us that we're talking here about um, the area right in the southeastern part of the Oxnard Plain. So what some people call Ormond Beach, what some people call Magoo Lagoon, I call the Magoo Ormond Complex because they really were one contiguous coastal wetland system before we started fragmenting it. So we, we talked about the example of Elkhorn Slough and the value we could gain from uh, looking at uh, historical sources of information, even just pictures, even stuff that wasn't quantitative per se, but we can glean some insights into how the system used to function or how the, function, uh, how the system functioned before it was disturbed. So now we're gonna tr transfer our attention to uh, our area again and uh, talk about how this has changed over time. So the very first thing here, it, this is the oldest map that I've been able to find of our area. This is from 1737. Uh, this is obviously during the um, uh, Spanish control era. And so here we go, uh, right here on the right, this is the Pacific Ocean. So we are looking um, basically south, southeastward. So all these dark bloopity bloop things are, is the Santa Monica Mountains. And so we're, we're essentially imagining that we are in the air over the Oxnard Plain looking towards Los Angeles, basically. Um, and so here is, here's the, here's the coastline again, here are the mountains, here is the Oxnard Plain unclear this may be round mountain right here so that the the area on campus on the on the corner of campus right at uh, Petrero and Lewis Road that that uh, area but this is what I want to draw your attention to so this 
this uh, obviously this map is in Spanish. This is Laguna. So this is the lagoon. And well, I'll, I'll just pause there. So 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 with that orientation, what uh, what do you guys think about this, or or can you glean any insights or any guesses um, from this? Uh, granted uh, sketch in a in a notebook that wasn't meant to be uh, a guide for restoration but but any any thoughts on this or any any comments no okay all right well Early in the morning, people are a little stressed out, maybe all that kind of excitement. I don't know what would be stressing people out or what would be distracting of late, but um, but everything's totally chill and normal and, and well-functioning. Uh, but um, when I look at this, when I look at this, what I what it tells me is first, first and foremost, there's all these names, right? So this is suggesting that these areas are being divvied up, right? Now, now we don't know is this is this uh, you know. Is this area here one mile? Is this area 20 miles, right? That kind of thing. Um, it's actually pretty large, I think. But but the point being, it already suggests that there's division happening in this landscape. It also, to me, tells me that there's this um, lagoonal structure. So this wetland ponded area here that is at least some distance from the coast some distance from the coast. Um, and uh, this is, so everybody see this guy? So this is Magoo Lagoon, World War II. So obviously this is, you know, 200 years plus after that last map. But generally, generally this area is, um, is, you know, intact or, 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 or more or less contiguous, at least this salt marsh complex. There's some stuff in World War II, there, there's some stuff going on right here on the, on the sand spit. Uh, we can see PCH already exists, the, the road already exists at the, bait, at the toe of the mountain. Um, but, and, and there's, there's something over here we can see on the edge, but, but the core of this area seems to be more or less intact. But what I wanna note for you is, is how is that we have extensive standing bodies of water, or at least impounded bodies of water. So let's jump over real quick. Let's jump over real quick. If I can. Okay, sorry. So let's go over here for a second. Let's go over here and do this. Let's go over here and look at campus. Everybody can, everybody can see my screen okay? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, check it out. So here, let me actually turn on the satellite image. Maybe that'll be a little better. Okay, so here's campus, right? So again, here's the Santa Monica Mountains. So campus is, lies within the Santa Monica Mountains. Here's Round Mountain. I'm gonna zoom in here, boom, boom. What's this road right here? You guys know the name of this road? The road that sort of continued from Potrero and you cross Lewis? Laguna Road. Laguna Road. Right. Why would they call that Laguna Road? There was a lagoon there at one time. Yeah. So this was named because the lagoon went at least this far inland, right? So we are used to seeing when we talk about, when we approach our restoration site or we approach our, our site that we're trying to solve completely natural again that shifted baseline idea we come in and we're like ah here's the here's the wetland or we go to the library and search for historic images like I did to get that World War II image for you and we're like and we say Magoo Lagoon you know or, or, or the latitude and longitude and, and search for images on that location totally natural nothing wrong with that but note that what we're focusing here uh I did, when I first approached this, when I first started working at Magoo Lagoon, I didn't, I didn't think that the wetland would be, you know, check it out, you know, like five miles inland. 
it, it went, it did go that far inland. Um, as we'll see in a second, that it also went all the way over here to Oxnard. So uh, uh, things have changed a lot. Okay, uh, what was our, what was this area like before the our modern California era? Um, we had a large, as as you can perhaps remember from that that uh, map with all the uh, historic Native American settlements um, in the area, uh, we, it was a large Chumash cultural center, very important uh, for um, uh, trade and all kinds of other things. And uh, we know that because when Cabrillo land, or when Cabrillo started exploring up here, uh, encountered these these large numbers of native peoples and villages, et cetera. Um, we call this area Magoo, sometimes spelled M-A-G-U, for unclear reasons, but but appears to have been um, a term that uh, was overheard by the native peoples speaking. And so, so that's where we get the name Magoo. It's a classic, uh, nobody knows exactly, but, but um, comes from a interpretation of a traditional term. Uh, not a whole lot changes in terms of the, the management, in terms of the wetlands, et cetera, um, until for about another 200 years or so. Um, the establishments of the California missions, San Buenaventura is obviously our local mission. Um, and that wasn't right at Magoo. Obviously that was, that was in the city of what we now call the city of Ventura. Um, but nevertheless, it, it began exerting influence on our area. Um, let me just check. Looks like there's some stuff in the chat. Hold on a second. What do you guys say in the chat? Oh, who's the artist of the map? Uh, sorry. Um, uh, don't recall. It was from the um, Santa Barbara Museum of, Hist of Art and History or History and Art. Um, I, I, I don't recall, Nathan. It was it was a it was a uh, explorer log. It was a it was a um, uh, comment about records in terms of how the lands were getting divvied up. Okay, uh, where was I? Uh, so okay, so 1782, the mission, the our local mission comes in. <clears throat> That's huge for various things. We know that um, this becomes a source of introduced organisms in terms of animals and introduced organisms in terms of plants. Some of these were intentional. So some of the, so again, we're, we, what the, in terms of the landscapes, what the missions did <clears throat> was bring in new organisms, change the immediate area in the vicinity of the mission, but then also sometimes lead to cascading changes across the region. The classic one here would be the introduction of, of uh, Eurasian livestock animals, uh, cattle, for example, goats. And um, generally speaking, because those critters came from say Europe and, and the people that uh, tended those animals knew what the animals would eat um, in Europe, they essentially imported those European diets for the organisms by and large. So they brought in um, forage plants for those animals. Um, uh, for example, uh, both both bulk, you know, uh, uh, wheat and, and and that kind of stuff, uh, and and, and cultiv cultivars, but also other plants that they brought in for uh, medicinal reasons or others. So, for example, brassicas are mustards that we see whenever we drive around our roads right now uh, on the sides of roads and disturbed areas, etc. Those were introduced. Um, uh, to quell the stomach, to uh, if a if a goat or a cow seemed to be having an upset stomach, you give them some mustard greens, um, and and so so we had this introduction of primary uh, plants, this introduction of sort of secondary plants or ancillary plants, and then we have the unintentional spread of weeds that might be stuck, you know, burrs in the on the fur of the the cattle or something of that nature. Um, 
and so all the, and then of course uh, the conversion of native or, or uh, natural landscapes into agricultural landscapes begins in this era. Okay, um, by the mid 1800s, essentially this whole area that we would call CSUCI, that we would call Magoo, that are part of the Santa Monicas, etc., are encompassed by one or more rancheros. Um, and uh, we get, uh, as I already showed you guys this before, but the US Coastal Survey map, first one comes online 1857, for, again, directed at navigation, coastal navigation for commerce, but tells us a little bit about the uh, area inside from the, or, or uh, landward of the coastline. We experienced our first major drought or, or huge drought in the region in eight, late 1860s. This was, this was statewide, so this was huge, but it really smacked us intensely in the early uh, to mid 1860s. Um, that was a huge story. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll hold that story. I think I've told some of you guys a story, but, but I'll hold that. Long story short, this is why we, this is one of the main reasons why most of our grasslands now are dominated by non-native European grasses, um, huge issue. Um, but suffice it to say, we, we changed the ecosystem in, with uh, 49ers coming in for the gold rush, huge rush of people, depopulation of our native ungulates, uh, deer, elk, things of that nature, introduction of our non-native ungulates, like you know, livestock, and then this, this drought really stresses out the plant community. A lot of our grasses die off and they're essentially that those landscapes are invaded by these plants that were brought uh, first by the, by the missionaries. Okay, um, by uh, the late 1800s, we have a lot of, uh, you know, the Oxnard Plain is recognized as very productive agricultural area. And so we wanna uh, take those commodities to markets. And so we, we uh, the first uh, uh, way to help that in a big way was this wharf built at Wainimi, Port Wainimi. It wasn't Port Wainimi then, but would become Port Wainimi. Um, here's an example of uh, oh, okay. So this is so this is some changing stuff. I'll just I'll just mention. So this is this is a project we did a few years ago um, with a high resolution benthic mapper. And this picture here is at Magoo. We're launching it into Magoo Lagoon, um, and this is basically. Um, some of you are familiar with how we do our topography mapping with our drones. We fly over our drones and we get the aerial uh, uh, topography of cliff sides, beaches, that kind of stuff. This is doing the same thing using um, uh, acoustic, uh, you know, pinging basically, um, but looking downwards once we're floating. Again, very high resolution, very high X, Y, and Z uh, resolution. And these were some of our initial passes. We were trying to map out what the bottom of the channel at Magoo looks like. But um, I wanted, we also did the same at some other sites, including the Santa Clara River Estuary. So this is our map of the topography, the, the benthic topography of um, uh, the Santa Clara River Estuary. And what we see here is, uh, um, what we see here, this is different uh, depths. So here's the ocean right here. Here's the campground, if you guys know, um, if you guys know that that area. And then here's the main channel. Um, here's the discharge for the um, um, city of Ventura. And what you see is there, there's some structure down here, right? There's structure. And so we can get, again, like, like the Lagoon, Laguna Road story, we come up here and we go, oh, hey, here's Harbor Boulevard. I wonder how our estuaries have changed. And it's very natural when we first approach the, again, shifted baselines, when we first approach these coastal systems, and we're asking, you know, what what were th what were things like, you know, what, we sort of get our arms around the shape of the the system, and we look at this and we go, oh, okay, look, Santa Clara River Estuary, aha. So here's this this year round perennial uh, flow from the Santa Clara River, and check it out. There, there, the, so this is deeper, right? So so the darker color, I think it's easier to see with this, right? So we we have these different these different um, surfaces here and the water would go this way or that way. And, and we think of this as the channel being constrained. In reality, this is where the Santa Clara River wandered. So the Cla Santa Clara, the mouth of the Santa Clara River has extended everywhere from Magoo Lagoon up to the city of Ventura. So I'll say that again. So right now we think of the Oxnard Plain as, as fueled by 
or is having three perennial water sources. The Ventura River up by Ventura, the Santa Clara River draining the central part of the Santa Clara Valley, Cayugas Creek, which goes right by campus and dumps now into Magoo Lagoon. Historically though, this channel has jumped all, Santa Clara has jumped all the way around, all the way up to the base of the mountains here at Magoo Lagoon, all the way up to the city of Ventura and, and the base of those mountains. So this whole floodplain is a pro, the whole area of the Oxnard Plain is a consequence of this um, movement of this perennial water source and the seasonal jumping out of the channel and uh, filling in of the alluvial plains or of that alluvial plain. So pretty cool. Uh, the other thing is, uh, and the, the other, other reason, so I'm, I'm showing you evidence, right? So I'm showing you evidence now. We talked, we have some maps that show the wetland, you know, in the 1700s, the, map, the wetland used to go all the way inland or, or much farther inland than we thought. We have some dynamic river systems that went back and forth. And so this is, this is uh, these are two friends of mine. Um, and this is Gene Harris, uh, this is Carmen, but, but, but I wanna talk about Gene Harris right now. And Jean um, was a wonderful lady, a great example of how you can, um, help people. So she, she was a person that dedicated her life to helping. She was an educator, teacher, we served on school boards forever. And um, she, uh, she's passed away now. I started doing some oral interviews with her. I did one oral interview and then unfortunately she passed away. I, I had plans to do, have her tell me stories for weeks and weeks on end. But, um, but she was one of the first people that reached out to me when I moved down to campus from, from Stanford from my previous university and to welcome me and say, hey, you got to start, you know, we're so excited you're here. We need you to start working on Ormond Beach and all this kind of stuff. So very, very welcoming. So the conservation of what we now know as Ormond Beach is really a direct result um, from uh, uh, Jean and her, um, and her partner, these two older women that people may, might look at and say, ah, oh, it's an old person, not super engaged. Man, decades and decades of lobbying and, and focused work. And so, so fantastic. Anyway, from this, one of these first oral inter the, the the recorded only um, oral interview I did with her, um, I was asking her about, tell me about the Magoo, Magoo area, Magoo Ormond area. And she said, uh, Roy, talking about this guy, Roy Lockwood, who, um, I'll just read it. Roy Lockwood has been deceased now for a long, long time. But when I first met him, meeting, first met him in the early mid seventies, he would tell me about the fishing camps they used to have out there, meaning Magoo. Um, and how when he was younger, he was a young boy and that would be somewhere in the 1910s or maybe 1920s. At high tide, he could pull his boat from Magoo Rock all the way to my, all the way to Wainimi Pier. And can you imagine, it must have been wonderful. So to be clear, what we're talking about is by, by, by pole boating, she means this guy had a flat bottom boat, very shallow draft. So it can be in, in waters that weren't particularly deep. And he could, he could start here in say 1915 or whatever it was. And at high tide, he could go all the way from here to Port Wainimi in a big, you know, coastal lagoon or large tidal creek. Crazy, one huge, massive complex. Um, so really, uh, really cool um, and really valuable, these insights that we don't always, we don't always have. Um, now, of course, this is an image from the era when I started working at Magoo in the, in the 1990s. And again, when we look at it now, we would think of no way, right? So this is the military base. This is this is the main reason why the base was created as a as a uh, aerial as as a as a um, landing strip and a way for to do aerial operations. And so you know we have this mass these massive runway complexes. No way could you pull a boat from from say over here to over here anymore. And so it's it seems completely um, anachronistic to say that that was uh, possible unless you know the history. 
Um, again, you've seen this. This is the overlay of our current situation and the coastal survey, red being the um, uh, conspicuous area of wetlands. Again, some of that stuff from um, uh, a century earlier would, su would suggest that the wetlands went at least, so here's, here's campus, right, went at least this far inland, right? And, but the coastal survey was only, wasn't focused on doing wetlands. These are just sort of the extra wetlands, but we know at least, at least the wetlands went at least as far in as the red and, and may well have gone significantly and probably did go significantly farther inland. Okay, other, other issues going on, other factors influencing this system historically, um, agriculture. So in the early, in the late 1800s to early 1920s, a lot of agriculture, but relatively in the modern era, relatively minimally impacting. What do we grow? We grew beans. Beans, if you recall from your intro bio lectures, beans are, are legumes. They are nitrogen fixers. So they don't need much fertilizer. They can essentially make their own, their own uh, fertilizer in their roots and their nodules. And so, um, so you don't need to do don't need to dump a lot of cow poop or anything like that on the landscape and they grow pretty well. The other, the other reason they did well is because of our June gloom. So because we have this relatively foggy area, right, in a lot of the summer, it cuts the heat down. So it cuts the evapotranspiration out. So farmers would plant beans and they would maybe water them in initially, but that was it. So there wasn't a lot of actively moving around of water in this very planar flat um, area of the Oxnard Plain. Everything changes in 1897. There's a recent book, a really interesting recent book that just came out um, about, about this, about the history of sugar beets and ag in and around Oxnard. But, but suffice it to say, um, turn of the eight, late 1800s, early 1900s, we see the introduction of sugar beets. What, why are sugar beets important? Sugar beets are a much more profitable crop. So you can take these beets and through an industrial process, you can you can take the sugars out and turn turn them into you know sweetener for you know basically sugar. Um, but but to grow sugar beets, they need a lot of fertilizer. They need a lot of water. If we start dumping a lot of water on our uh, very flat landscape, it's going to pond up. So then, if we start bringing in a lot of water for this this new category of crops, then we also need to start removing that water. Um, and really changing the hydrology of the system. Um, by 1900s, pretty much all these, these low impact, relatively um, uh, low profitability, um, but, but crops that don't need a huge amount of water, huge amount of fertilizer, that kind of stuff, those are pretty much gone. And by the early 1900s, we're seeing these, this massive, mo what we now consider a modern agricultural landscape emerging. So very intensive agriculture, and, and expanding, so, so um, moving into different areas, and again, beginning to encroach on our wetland areas, which is the focus of what we're talking about here today. By the mid-1800s, or mid-1900s, excuse me, we see a lot of crop diversification, the introduction of strawberries, things of this nature, and then with more diverse crops come more diverse needs of hydrology and chemical additives and things of that nature. So here is um, so now we're looking from um, uh, we're looking from essentially the Santa Monicas towards Oxnard. Um, so here we can see uh, the um, uh, Magoo Lagoon area. Um, we see there's a little pier here. I don't know if you guys can quite see that. This is the Magoo Fishing Pier. Um, Sandy Beach, uh, Cayugas Creek is coming in, um, hits this area. Water goes southward, and then and then there's more of a mouth down here as we've seen before. But we can see all this crop, um, or, or uh, all, all the, the landscape behind the salt marsh pretty much already sliced up. Another trend that we have historically, so we have this trend of increasing ag encroachment on the wetlands. We also have this trend of increasing access, increasing public accessibility. Starts with a, a railroad that comes in 1901, uh, and then this, and then this uh, road here, the steamship road, uh, uh, comes in, in in 1919, what we originally called the Roosevelt or the Roosevelt Highway, um, what we now call PCH, begins in the 1920s. It's expanded in 1933 to three lanes. Ooh, super fast, super big. Um, and the pass is blown, uh, or, or the uh, the road used to go around Point Magoo, 
now uh and a lot of people would call dead man's curve because it was it was a basically almost a 90 degree turn and it was really foggy people would drive off the the road bed all the time into the ocean and die and so we blew the pass um what we now consider magoo the the area that um makes magoo rock look distinct from the rest of the santa monica mountains the, that pass was uh started in 1937 it was finally completed in 1940 so it was much safer to go to ventura from la etc um, and the Navy base comes into play uh, in World War II. So world, the naval base at, um, in World War II obviously brings a lot more people to Magoo. The before then, the, most of the modern visitors were uh, fish, folks that would come fish on the weekends kind of thing and then go back. Now we have this more resident population. What was Magoo used for? Magoo was used for a um, a tr and originally a training area. So the, the thing that originally brought people to Magoo was not the wetland, it was the beach. So uh, at the time our, our aircrafts can't, can't fly very far. They have to you know, fly land, refuel, fly land, refuel. So it was difficult, for example, we're fighting this war with Japan to, to you, couldn't, you could not fly from California straight to um, Japan, let's say. So you did this island hopping thing. And so as the US and the allies started taking over control of Pacific Islands that required the building of airstrips. And so Magoo Lagoon was a perfect place to train the Seabees, the Naval Construction Battalions, for how they would jump across the Pacific. And so that meant you know, you know, taking over an island and then the engineers had to come out and make a landing strip. And so we had all these flat beaches here, in sandy areas uh, at Magoo Lagoon. So they bring in these 19-year-old you know, recruits, teach them how to bulldoze flat this area how to lay um, you know, different structures down and essentially make a, a mobile landing strip. They do that for a couple of weeks, show them how to do it. Then they'd rip it up, send those folks off into war and they bring another crew of, of uh, trainees in and they would teach them how to do it. So that, that, that's why that was the value that Magoo had initially. Soon after, uh, after that, there was, it was realized there was additional value for um, this site. And so the military, again, created the, the permanent base that has changed names, but we now call, now as part of Naval Base Ventura County. And so uh, here we see, so this is the war. This is just after World War II, early 1950s. And you can see the lagoon is here, the wetland system is here, but all this agricultural encroachment has gone right up to the beach. It's gone right up into the edge of the lagoon. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, so another key thread, another key part of the history here is what how people recreate in the area. Uh, and in particular, I wanted, so I met, already mentioned there was a fish camp that people could come out and fish and, and spend uh, time doing that kind of stuff. Uh, but there's two important game preserves that still exist. One, the Ventura County Game Preserve, and one, the Point Magoo Game Preserve. These are areas around the periphery of, well, what used to be in the, in the middle of the Magoo-Ormond um, complex, but now we view them more as, as areas on the periphery. So these are areas that are actively managed to encourage uh, waterfowl for hunting. For They're privately held, um, and so it's private, a private hunting operation, basically. And so that, that, those folks there, very uh, uh, with a high degree of accuracy, control the water level because they want to have water for, for migrating birds and ducks primarily to come land on here, et cetera. The other big uh, user of this area would be the movie industry. And this was a huge area for shooting films um, at the end of the silent uh, movie era. So this is Magoo Lagoon. Here you see the fishing pier at Magoo Lagoon that again is no longer there. It was destroyed by a hurricane actually, a storm, tropical storm. Um, and so we will have more of those. We will have more hurricanes striking us here in Ventura County, thanks to climate change. But check it out, there's all these people, right? Tons and tons and tons of people here. And this is this is all being staged so these folks can, can shoot this uh, movie scene. And so Magoo would frequently be transformed into a tropical island. They bring in palm trees, et cetera. Um, so very heavily used uh, by Hollywood. And then we have, uh, so this is an example. So the, the title of this picture was a typical Saturday catch. So here's the pier, the fishing pier. Check it out. There's tons of people there. This is a giant sea bass. This is uh, what we used to call a black sea bass. Um, this is uh, an endangered species. 
um, used to be very, very important, it still is, but, but historically was much more ecologically important in our kelp beds. And the fact that this fish was pulled off by this you know, older lady just with a fishing pole says how abundant these organisms were. And it also tells us there was probably more extensive kelp um, beds right in uh, close to the wetland, um, close to the coastline um, as compared to today's modern age. Sorry, I, I see there's, there's more and more comments. I, I'm not keeping up on the chats. If you guys, if you guys have a question, um, uh, unmute and just ask, ask them to me, please. Um, okay, then the most recent threat to this, the Magoo Ormond complex. So, so the military base goes in World War II. The military base saves much of the wetlands. Um, I'll say that again, the military base that this thing here saves much of the wetlands. Why do I say that? Were it not for the military base here, this patchwork would go all the way completely to the beach. Those of you that came up with us to, to Ash Avenue last week, if you, or, or anybody that's driven that part of the coast, you can see there's, there's, there's active cultivation on the tops of you know, cliff bluffs, you know, 10 feet, 15 feet from the edge of the cliffs. So left unchecked, this, especially before the modern era of environmental protection, you know, this, this development, th this agricultural development would have gone right up to the ocean's edge. So the fact the military base was here isn't ideal, right? I mean, check this out. So we dredged much of the, we scooped out sediment from much of the wetland and dumped it in here to fill in, to raise the elevations so that we could build the landing strips and the buildings that, would, that wouldn't flood, that wouldn't be below you know, flood level. So a huge amount of impacts to the military base, massive degradation and impacts to that system. Later on, we'll talk about um, the sewage pond restoration, salt marsh restoration I did, and that's that's right here. Um, but but you know, obviously, obviously, this is not ideal. This this is this is impacting the system. But 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 the military base has fences. The military base has guards. The military base has barking dogs if you come close to the fence. So. So that means that there is some level of protection, right? The other thing about this base is, even though, yes, there are impacts, I, I don't want to say there were none, but in the grand scheme of things, this is not a bunch of 18-year-olds driving tanks around blowing stuff up, right? This is primarily an air warfare um, uh, base. So mostly we're shooting missiles and figuring out radar and things of that nature landing planes, taking off planes. Yes, planes crash every so often into the wetlands and cause problems, but it's not as if the majority of the area is being actively disturbed continuously, continuously, continuously. So as a consequence, these areas that weren't directly manipulated, they are, they are, they are in a sense uh, preserved, right? Has there been when any I started studies? my P Say again? Sorry. Has there been any studies on if the jet engines have any effect on the birds there? Oh yeah, they know they, they clearly do. They clearly do. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, one of the, it's usually the other way around though. The studies are mostly about how the birds screw with the planes. So I mentioned like the most recent airplane crash we had was a, was a, um, a bird, uh, a bird strike hitting the plane. I can't remember if it was taken off or landing, but one of them and the plane you know, aborted and crashed. So usually, there's been a lot of studies about birds and planes interacting there, um, but it's mostly from the perspective of the birds are a threat to the people. So that actually, this is one of the reasons why the, the naval um, entity, the, the military base, is a big funder of restoration efforts and a big supporter of restoration efforts in the area. For example, Ormond Beach, with the idea being, hey, if we can restore some wetlands a bit farther away from the from the um, runways, um, that means, in theory, right? That should mean that there are fewer birds next to the runway, right? And so, therefore, that means there's fewer strikes. So they don't they don't typically look at it as planes impacting the birds. They look at it as the birds impacting the planes. Does that make sense? Yeah, got it. Thanks. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. So anyway, so 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 I did my PhD at UCLA. And I, I, my background is in marine biology, underwater stuff. Um, 
and so you know those of us doing underwater stuff did underwater stuff but um, most of my colleagues worked in terrestrial systems so most of the ecology grad students were working on grasses or trees or lizards or stuff like that um, and uh, of the students in my I don't know what the current situation is but the students in my era so this is the you know 1990s um, uh, I would say you know conservatively conservatively probably about 60 percent of the graduate students doing work in terrestrial systems in California and the U.S. 60% of them were working on military bases. Not necessarily 100% on military bases, but at least studied some of their organisms on military bases. That's because many of these Department of Defense lands are now some of the best representative or, or, or best remaining landscapes that we have, either to conserve you know, endangered species or as a reference condition for that system, whatever. It's true that that some military bases, you know, again, folks drive tanks around and blow stuff up and all that jazz. But, but the the Department of Defense owns so much landscapes, and generally speaking, generally speaking, the Department of Defense, when they're doing these kinds of things, training people assaulting mountains or surviving in the desert or something of that nature, they generally speaking want the landscape intact so that they can train their people in that real system. So. Um, so they'll, you know, they'll, they'll screw over an endangered species or two here or there, but by and large, they're not interested in turning everything into a Walmart parking lot, for example. Um, and so, and Magoo is an example of that, I, I would argue. Okay, so where were we? Um, uh, yeah, okay, so, so then, then the modern era of threats to this Magoo Orman complex area um, really starts in the 70s and this idea of, hey, we can, we can again, just like we talked about before, wetlands being not systems, wetlands being areas that have no value inherently, so therefore we need to change them to add value to the system. We start getting this series of proposals, for example, to make resorts. And so um, uh, I, I love all these things. So this, this, is, this is at uh, what we now consider Ormond Beach. Um, and this is, uh, and here, here's a bunch of um, uh, you know uh, uh, high-end hotel things, and I love that they have. They always introduce pools, so that they come and they destroy the lagoon, they destroy the coastal system, and then they introduce you know a saltwater pool for for uh, recreation. Okay, hydrologically speaking, what's going on with this area? Hydrologically speaking, um, we see the again late 1800s, early 1900s. We start seeing these other crops brought in, and the need to uh, water those crops a lot. So uh, we, uh, Cayugas, by 1884, Cayugas Creek is channelized all the way up from Magoo to the 101, what's now the 101. Um, and by, and that, that's sort of the first, what we called, what came to be described as drainage district. By the late 1920s, we start having additional drainage districts, essentially adding geography to the, the hydrological replumbing of the Oxnard Plain. Um, and, uh, and it just sort of continues around. We start levying the area around the creek and around Magoo proper in the thir early 30s. And by the mid 40s, it, it's just intense. The whole system is intensely channelized. So the flows are, are lots of efforts have gone underway to try to contain the flows, contain seasonal flooding, uh, direct water to certain places, drain water from other places, et cetera. And again, the military base, the Magoo Lagoon itself was dredged such that we could scoop up enough sediment to turn the, the areas we have buildings and, and uh, runways and the like uh, to raise that elevation one to four meters, which is a huge amount of sediment. So we sucked a lot of sediment out of the wetlands, dumped them onto other parts of the wetland to turn them into terrestrial uh, uh, elevated, uh, the, the, the elevation of a terrestrial landscape. Um, and so this is an important one I want to uh, show you. This is from a cover of a really cool report by Onuf, um, a report from the 80s. But here we go. So we're looking straight down at Magoo Lagoon. Okay, so here's the ocean at the bottom of the image. The um, uh, PCH, uh, let's say using the scientific one, PCH would be up about here and the Santa Monica Mountains here. Um, one, one other uh, aspect I should note is uh, what we have right, um, right off off of here, off of Magoo, is Magoo Canyon, which is a deep sea canyon. So the, a lot of our sediment that hits there actually goes straight down, uh, it, or you know, doesn't 
necessarily hang out in a flat um, near shore area, but rather it, it, it blasts down this canyon and gravity falls down into the, to the abyss, um, into the coastal, well, yeah. Not the, not the abyssal depths, but you guys get the idea. Okay, so, um, so one of the things that was done with the military base is it was thought this could also be a, a Cold War um, submarine base. And so the idea was we could take all of our Cold War submarines or some of our Cold War submarines, uh, if, we, if we permanently prop open the mouth, we could come up the mouth, come into the mouth, go into this big area. And this area has been excavated. So this area was scooped out. Remember I said we sucked a lot of that sediment out to raise the rest of the base a certain elevation. So we scooped, and this is one of the places they scooped a lot of sediment out. So we, we, we create a larger lagoon, a lot larger, um, at least lagoon, right, right, contiguous lagoon, right proximate to the, to the, to the beach. And the idea here was um, these, these submarines could hide in the deep sea canyon come up Magoo Canyon at night, presumably, or something, go into Magoo Lagoon, do a full 360 turnaround, dock up, refuel, and then go back out to sea. Um, so, so the excavation served two purposes. The excavation served to both um, get sediment to build stuff, but it also created an opportunity. Um, it's unclear whether this was ever used as a submarine turning basin or a submarine refueling thing. It's, I'm, I'm skeptical it actually was. There's no evidence. And in talking to a lot of these old folks that worked at the base, there's, I don't think that ever really happened, but, but at least theoretically, that was one of, the, one of the interests. Regardless, we have this huge area of the, of the, okay, so this right here would be vegetated marsh, right here, this, this area here. This white would be sandy beach. This dark color here, it, and, and this would also be sort of base. So this would be a, a salt marsh here in the, the dark color. And then the rest of this is, is sort of base terrestrial area that they've, you know, buildings and the like. So this dark area is standing water and we're looking at high tide. And everybody's okay, right? Everybody can see this picture, these pictures okay? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, so here we go. So here's 1971, cool. Here's 1977, more or less unchanged, right? So we see that, that the, the, the shape of this, um, the, the geomorphology of this area is more or less the same. Um, and then something radically happens here in 1978 and continues on in the early 80s. So now when we're looking here, it's the standing water. Here the standing water is this big, huge, you know, more or less open blob. Here, it's really primarily in this one channel. This is now mud flat. So mud flat, mud flat. What happened? We had one El Nino, intense El Nino storm in uh, 1977 or early 78. I can't remember what, what year, 77, 78. But there was an El Nino that season. Massive, massive rainfall. Really, 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 really poor sediment management practices. As you guys drive around Ventura County, you know that not only do we have all this great ag land, crop land, we have a ton of orchards, especially uh, avocados and lemons and citrus. So the flatlands were being used by the, by the row croppers. So we start to see um, in the 1900s, these, this, the, the orchards, the tree production, the tree agriculture moves up on the hillsides. There was very poor erosion control, sediment control. So when we had this big storm in the 70s, it just ripped tons and tons of sediment and massive erosion. So much so that we went from before this period in the 1970s, at high tide, we had about, um, uh, uh, let's see, wait, what, what are the, what's, the, what's the factoid? We went from, um, yeah, and so at high tide, we went from about um, one third, wait, no, sorry, we went from two thirds of this area being water at high tide, or, or, or at, least, at least covered with water, to after this one three day storm event, to went from two thirds standing water to one third standing water. So in this one storm period, so much erosion happened that we essentially filled in much of Magoo Lagoon. So much of this stuff that was excavated 30 years before to fill in the military base, at least in the central basin, we call this the central basin area of, of Magoo, not in some of the other extremities, but in the main area by the you know, proximate to Cayugas Creek, we dumped all the sediment and essentially jumped forward 
a, you know, decades in terms of the sedimentation rate. So that's more or less the system we have now. So now this is a pretty much a contiguous, uh, or this is you know the water area here, the main creek channel, and this is now emergent marsh. This is emergent marsh, vegetated marsh. Uh, there continues to be pressure to develop this area. We have all kinds of other stressors, while the military-based stressors in terms of fragmentation and destruction have more or less not changed in the last you know, many decades. Ormond has been, so the Ormond Beach chunk of the Magoo Ormond complex, the area outside, the area west of the base wall or the base uh, fence line, um, has been experiencing continuous pressure. And so in this case, this is the, the most conspicuous one you can see from campus, we can see all around. This is the Reliant Power Plant, the subject of huge debate. Um, this, uh, as with many other, for those of you that don't know, as with many of our power plants, this was, we originally had you know, utilities um, and there was one utility for us, essentially Southern California Edison. We essentially had three major utilities in California. We had Pacific Gas and Electric for Central and Northern California. SoCal Edison for Southern California and San Diego Gas and Electric for um, the area around San Diego. And that was it. With the era of deregulation though, um, these, uh, these assets have, some of these assets have been sold off. And so in this case, this particular power plant has changed hands several times, but originally it was put in by Southern California Edison um, and, it, and it became <clears throat> active in 1971. And this is right in the middle of this remnant wetland complex. So we have this huge area. Um, originally it was built to, to take um, uh, uh, um, fuel oil, so, so kind of dirty, dirty oil. Uh, they've since been converted to uh, gas turbines, high, high efficiency uh, turbines. But this is primarily what we call a peaker plant. So this is primarily a plant that's not it wasn't designed to be running all the time. It's designed to be um, when we have summertime brown outages or we, you know, every has demand, the summertime it turns on. So it's not even used continuously. Um, there are various issues with this. This is part of the, the active debate of, of retiring um, uh, old dirty power plants. Um, it's been given continual life though, because of things like shutting down the San Onofre nuclear generating station um, a decade or so ago because of some safety concerns and, and other things, but it, but it sort of keeps hanging on, but it's, 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 it's life is precarious. How are we doing on time, you guys? Sorry, I'm rambling on here. Uh, uh. Okay, so we're okay. So we'll finish this and we'll take our break. Okay, the other big challenge we have here, the other big, um, uh, uh, novel threat is the Halico, what we now call the Halico Superfund site. So here we're looking at, now the, the power plant is just off to the right of this picture. So this is this other big uh, challenge in terms of re the restoration. So this is the company, this is, Halico is the name of a company. This was a recycling um, um, company that took all kinds of things, old metal, et cetera, recycled it. Generally we like recycling, like great, you know. Couple questions. Why was why do you think a recycling plant was here in this in this in this particular location in this salt marsh? Why did the company locate it in this specific location? So they could dump waste into that water channel. Uh, yeah. Well, well. I, let's see. They would say they weren't actively dumping waste, but but uh, yeah, good. So somebody else expand on that. Somebody else. Tell me more about some ideas there. No ideas? Maybe to help the plant um, be cool while it's running. Hmm. That's absolutely why the power plants are there, totally. Um, in this case, they didn't need that, but it's a, but that's a great guess. And that's why a lot of industry was there that needed to you know generate power. So good guess. But in this case, um, didn't so much need the cooling. But other guesses or other thoughts? 
Uh, in the chat, Nathan said wastewater, but I also, uh, I had to step away for a bit to the bathroom, so I missed the question. Uh, okay. Dr. Anderson, could you <laughs> well, thanks for your again? honest answer, Chris. I appreciate that. We'll take a break in a second for everybody that needs a bathroom break. Um, yeah, so the question is, so we have, we have in terms of the Ormond area, we have two, um, uh, what I said was that Magoo, most of the impacts in terms of the landscape have basically happened when the base went into effect, right? So, so even though there's still impact from pollution and this and that and bird strikes, so we're not actively fragmenting most of the landscape at Magoo after the creation of the military base. Ormond, there are continual things that are fragmenting the landscape, one of which is the power plant. And then just a little bit to the west of the power plant is this Halico site. And so this is, as I mentioned, this was an area that was um, uh, uh, a metal recycling um, facility. And so I'm asking, why do you guys think that this, why was this a good location for this metal recycling company to locate to? Because they were getting a lot of waste from the military base. Ooh, good question. Yeah, uh, quite possible. In fact, we'll talk about in a second. Uh, some of the waste they got was uh, the waste from uh, a decommissioned nuclear reactors. So good guess, but but they're taking waste from all over the place, but that, that's a natural guess. Other, other guesses? Did they need to use the seawater for anything? Uh, nope, didn't need, didn't need seawater. It's like on the outskirts of the town, so maybe if something catastrophic happened, it would be out of the way. Ooh, so good, Ashley. So, so, um, yeah, so the idea of on the outskirts of town is key. Um, so you're thinking that if a disaster happened, they didn't want to hurt people. Um, uh, um, that's not how this company thought, unfortunately. Uh, so, um, so wetlands, stinky. People don't like wetlands, right? So let's put the, the crap industry there, right? One. Two. Um, uh, Oxnard, Port Wanimi, is that a wealthy area? Not particularly. Not particularly, right? So the closest community, the closest uh, residents here, um, apartment complexes. Um, a lot of uh, multi, you know, multi-family, multi-generational housing. A lot, who's living there? A lot of farm workers. A lot of folks that are, you know, undocumented workers, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. Spanish speakers. Um, great place to put a messy industry, right? Are people gonna if we if we put this in, um, I don't know, Brentwood or Malibu or downtown Santa Barbara? I guarantee, within the first week, calls start coming in. Hey, what the hell is this smell? This thing is too loud. These guys are working beyond their hours, right? Are, is our our community that might be a little bit, uh, you know, legally not totally above boards? Are they going to call the cops every time something's going on? No, right? No. So, so the fact that this plant was here was not by accident. It wasn't for the salt water. It was because it was cheap land, stinky, smelly, cheap land, wetlands. Nobody cares about those. One, two. It's around populations that won't complain. So this is an environmental justice thing, straight up, no question, right? Um, so um, again, we, we, we would tend to think of this industry, as, the recycling industry is a good thing, right? And generally speaking, recycling industry is good, right? We wanna reuse these, these materials and, and, and not put them in landfills, et cetera. Halico though was, um, it, you know, I, I don't like to attack people, <laughs> um, but it's, th this was not a, good company. I'll just say that, you know, objectively. So what we're seeing here, now the company no longer exists, it, it was, when, um, it's bankrupt. But in 2002, when this picture was taken, the plant is still, uh, the, the, the industrial activities are still going on. And they would take metal, aluminum, whatever the heck, and essentially smelt them down. So remelt the stuff. And then the parts that were usable, they'd, they'd use the stuff that was the, 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 you know, skanky top of the boiling metal, whatever the heck it is, all those other products that, that weren't reusable, they would do something with. What would they do something with? 
they'd just throw right here and they'd make some more and they'd throw the stuff over there again. They make some more to fill the stuff right there. So what we're looking at, so this is the, this is the industrial operations area. This is the, you know, where people were employed. This is their waste pile, this huge giant thing. And it is, it is huge. So when I came to the university, uh, the, the, this company was still in existence. It shut down very soon after that. But, but so what we're looking at here is we're, we're standing in the wetland and we're looking towards this Halico pile, also called a slag pile. So, you know, this is, you know, a hundred feet high, uh, acres and acres and acres of toxic sludge, right? The, well, it's dried, but it's, it's the remnant of all this, the slurry of all this horrible stuff. And they just dumped it there, right? This is what it looked like before stabilization. We'll talk more about what happened when we later, but, um, but uh, all kinds of bad behavior going on here. Starting in the 1970s, the California um, um, Supreme Court, and, 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 and th these are legal documents that I'm showing you here, uh, from, from legal cases, were doing things um, uh, illegally, even for the laws at the time of the early 1970s. And the courts would say, hey, you can't do that, right? You can't, you can't um, allow that pollution to happen. And yeah, you, you have to, you can't let, can't let this dust blow off and blow into the laboring community, right? Toxic dust. Again, environmental racism, right? Environmental justice huge part of this because who cares right the owners of these plants don't live nearby right donors to the political parties don't live nearby right it's in and it's sort of an industrial area so well you're in an industrial area what do you expect you know that kind of thing so they actively 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 disobeyed rules and regulations they were supposed to follow um and so uh when when activists uh, uh, like Jean Harris, um, uh, her colleagues, et cetera, when some of the people would go out to start, when they realized there was a problem, they start trying to take water samples from the water around here. There's reports of um, guards from the plant going up on the top of the slag pile and shooting at them. Now, I don't think any person was trying to kill another person, but they were certainly trying to warn people off. So if you have a guy with a rifle standing at somewhere and vaguely shooting near you, that's, that's, uh, that's different. That's not a typical uh, stakeholder interaction, I would say. And so, um, so all kinds of craziness has gone on. So the two stressors we have for Ormond now, the two biggest stressors are the existence of this power plant and this, and because the company's now bankrupt, this toxic Superfund site. This abandoned site that now you get to pay for. You all the taxpayers get to pay for. Time and time and time again, we see this. Uh, for just a quick refresher, if you don't remember, so our, uh, the EPA set up the Superfund site in the 1980s because we had so many abandoned um, industrial toxic sites. The idea is supposed to be if a company creates a pollution problem, they are supposed to clean it up. But the typical MO has been uh, oil and gas companies in Louisiana, um, uh, 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 you know, chemical manufacturing plants in New Jersey, uh, Halico here in California, you pick it. Um, most industrial actors are good folks. Most industrial actors are not trying to be evil and trying to pollute, but we have this consistent proportion of the industry that sees the idea here is make a bunch of money, make a bunch of money, leave and leave you to clean up. And so, so to deal with that, the EPA created the super fund, um, this, this, this thing called the super fund, which is for the worst of the worst um, uh, uh, areas that are posing a massive threat to the environment or a massive threat to human health and to fund the um, cleanup of that. And, and don't wanna talk about that now, but suffice it to say, um, <laughs> it's gonna take a long time, right? It, it, uh, there, there are way more sites than we have funds to clean up. And so as a consequence, it's very slow to do the cleaning up. But nevertheless, Halico is now a super fun site. The companies have been abandoned. The, the family that owns the companies made all kinds of money. They, they, they hid all their money. So they're all really super you know, millionaire, millionaire rich, but we are left to clean up 
the waste. Uh, there's various sensitive species here. As with most of our wetland sites, we have some of these, these uh, salt, salt marsh birds beak, a hemiparasite. I think we talked a little bit about this up at Ash Avenue, um, uh, birds, etc. cetera. Um, uh, the other uh, thing I'll just mention, uh, Nathan is in our class and he and some, uh, maybe some of the other, other students in this class have helped us at various times doing mapping of Ormond Beach. And one thing we've noticed, uh, and so these are two of our uh, sand dwelling uh, species that also will live in the, in the salt flats, or at least, at least the terns will live in the salt flats of the salt marsh as well, not just on the sandy beach. But this is some old data now, but this is, this is data from 2008. And these are, the, these are the nest distributions in 2008. So here we go. So this right here is the fence between the naval base over here on the right. And then this is what we now call Ormond Beach. Um, so here you see salt marsh, all that kind of good stuff. Here is the um, uh, power plant, the Reliant Power Plant. Here is that Halico Superfund site. So we have uh, naval base, some uh, you know salt marsh, and then we have the sort of storage field and and the and the power plant. Then we have some salt marsh, some salt marsh, and then we have the a toxic dump site and some more salt marsh up here. You can also see the encroachment of these ag fields very close into the, you know, close to the coast. So these are these are the, the, the stressors that we're facing now. We also have a history of homeless folks living on the beach. And so uh, uh, this is uh, driftwood structures that have, that was, was constructed. So we would do stuff, uh, it's gotten better, but initially we would do stuff like come in and, and um, we weren't allowed to take these structures down because they were considered homes for people. So we'd have to do a public notice, the sheriff would have to do a public notice, leave a sign up there for three days. Then we could come in and, and disassemble these structures. Um, and then almost invariably they would be reassembled the next day. So these folks are, are and not many of these folks have dogs and all that kind of stuff. So huge stress for the native birds, et cetera like these little chicks here. Um, low elevations, which we can talk about, a uh, uh, huge different control of the lands. So here is one of those, so here's the military base. Here's the fence line. Here's Ormond Beach right here. Here is one of the game preserves that I mentioned. Here's the other game preserve. And check it out. These are managed as different cells of, um, of water, um, of, of floodable cells. And again, the idea here is to encourage um, birds. Here we have all this uh, uh, land encroachment, uh, excuse me, a farm encroachment. Here's the power plant, here's Halico. And then uh, the ownership of this land currently is, is more similar. So again, Malibu was a single owner, state parks. We mentioned with Ash Avenue, how we had um, a, 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 a diversity of landowners. In this case, it's also a diversity of landowners. Some of the land that's potentially restorable is owned by the Nature Conservancy. Some is owned by the city of Oxnard and some is owned by the California Coastal Conservancy, a state agency. Um, yeah, I can talk more about that, but, but I think we're uh, running out of time here. I'll just note that we've divided this area in different planning units for restoration planning. Mm -hmm. And we have different proposals for how we might go about restoring it. Long story short, we have plans if nothing happens with the, with the Superfund site and the power plant and, and, and potential plans if we're able to remove those two major impediments. Uh, the last thing I'll just say uh, before we take our break is, is it's a real bummer because if you guys look at the drain, if you look at the drainage right here, this is the low, this is the low part of um, the uh, Oxnard Plain right here. And by low, I mean a couple feet lower. So this is a natural drainage. The, the water wants to go like this, boom, straight through to the ocean right here. So actually this super fun site is right in the middle of where the, the coastal connectivity should be happening. So not only is it just physically in the way, it, it's really problematic in terms of um, uh, water entering and leaving the site in terms of this coastal salt marsh. Okay, so that's a, that's a little bit about our history. So, so that, that, that's a really in-depth look Rarely do we have the amount of time or resources to really fully understand the history of a system, but that's one thing. If you do have the time, those things are all helpful, right? So understanding the hydrology, understanding the, the human access, understanding um, all these different stressors can really paint a more complete picture of the injuries that have happened to the system and how we might want to respond to those uh, injuries in terms of our restoration planning. So that's, 
that's a, an in-depth background of a particular site. Cool? Cool. Any general questions about that before we take our, take our break? Any general questions about um, um, you know, approaches to, to thinking of reference conditions or thinking of historic conditions um, of a site like the Magoo Orman complex? Can you tell me those two game preserves that you just pictured in the last slide, mm -hmm. that looks like all agricultural land there. How is it they function as game preserves? Is that not all agriculture? This is agriculture, where my cursor is agriculture. Uh -huh. Unit two is agriculture, unit one is agri- or, or some of unit one is agriculture. Uh -huh. This unit three, which are the two game preserves, are, is not agriculture. They're, they're privately held, um, you know, they, they've been privately owned for over a hundred years and operated as game preserves for about a century. So um, to be clear, um, Can you give me any streets to go by? I can't. Okay, there's the naval base. Yeah, yeah. So here's PCH. So, so here, let's let, let's. Uh, so, so this is what I do. So, so I'll, I'll do that uh, after the break. Okay. So, so, so we'll, we'll we'll talk a little bit. But, but suffice it to say, here's PCH. This is Arnold Road. Right here it is. Here's Arnold Road right here. Here's Wainimi Road. Okay. So, so, um, so you can't easily get to the game preserve. Oh, get, to, okay. get to the game preserve. You need to go down these small ag roads basically. Okay. And, and, right. just, and just to be clear, <laughs> these are these are billionaire owned. So one of them I think has only 13 owners. Okay. Many of which live in New York City and far away. <laughs> so right. these are folks that will fly in. The road. <laughs> these are folks these are folks that will at least some of them will fly in for a weekend or two a year to go hunt. Really? Okay. All right, thank you. That's that's good, Dr. A. So I, I don't I don't want to I don't want to prejudice about any particular activity uh -huh. but but this is not a this is you can't you cannot become a member of one of these game preserves, right? Oh. Um, I couldn't shoot a duck anyway. You can't shoot a duck. Now now they're they are um, influenced by fish and game they have some guidance and things in that but but by and large these, these are private facilities managed yeah. for private individuals and they're great grandfathered in yeah and you cannot go there i cannot go there all right you will not, you will not be allowed in all right okay thank you yeah any other questions before we, we pause for our break or sorry i went too long here okay so i got i got 10 13 i'm going to stop the recording and uh, I'm going to give us a 10-minute break. I will see everybody back in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 